They finally caught up with the three thieves, an old man with a white beard, a young man about 30, and a boy 15 or 16. The posse took them to the nearest cottonwood tree and told them they were going to hang them. Walter related the old man said, it doesn't make much difference if you hang me. I don't have much time to live anyway, but this boy is young. He's made a mistake, but give him another chance. He has life ahead of him. Walter said, I decided I didn't want any part of the execution, and I left. They hanged all three of the thieves. It was the way they did in the West. A happier story was of the morning when the cowboys waking in their cabin saw three men riding toward them and one cowboy said here comes the preacher and two men with him someone asked how do you know it's a preacher and the cowboy said nobody else rides a horse like a preacher but of all the things he saw or did in those years in the west none made as great an impression on the young Hoser Farmer, as the epitaph he read on the gravestone of a cowboy. He quoted it afterward many times in conversation and letters. One could cold December day in 1958, he wrote me, I have not been in my usual health for some weeks. For the first time in my life, I did not feel like going downtown. Nothing serious, just the burden of 91 years of living. Summing up these years, I think of the cowboy. He had been a cowhand for many years and had made many a drive, had driven 3,000 steers from Old Mexico to Montana. He had helped move his herd across the great rivers from the Rio Grande to the Powder River in Montana. The time had come to die. His fellow cowhands asked what they should inscribe on his gravestone. His reply was just to say he done his, this is what I have done for 91 years. With love to you and all, Grandpa at 91 plus. He mentioned this epitaph so many times, I think perhaps he sometimes felt he would like having it on his own gravestone in Riverside Cemetery. One reason Walter's eyes always looked so large and blue and luminous was that one always saw them magnified by the thick lens he had to wear. Early in his middle years, his sight began to fail from cataract to both eyes. Even before his oldest son was out of high school, Walter had been almost blind at one time. In that year, in order to know what kind of stand his planted corn was making, he went out to the field and crawled along one row, counting the distance. And number of sprouted grains in each hill. He finally had one eye operated on. The operation was successful, and the doctor gave him instructions about taking care of the eye, but he neglected to follow the instructions and consequently lost the sight of that eye again. In later years, he had to have an operation on the other eye. It also was successful, but he always had to wear highly magnifying glasses to read with, and in addition, he used, he used a reading glass held in his hand. The frames of his spectacles made no pretense of being fashionable, they were round, silverish metal, and the shafts held them on by curving behind the ears. When the nose piece broke, or the shafts broke, or bore too heavily on his ear, he wrapped the place in layers and layers of adhesive tape until finally the spectacles looked like some kind of structure rather than mere spectacles. When he was telling a story that deepened his feelings, either of tenderness or merriment, his eyes looked even larger. Telling his best love stories, his voice took on a velvety understatement. The more moving the story seemed, the more simply he spoke. Telling a funny story, he had a habit of looking down 
until he got to the explosive point of the story, then suddenly looking up and into the listener's eyes and exploding into a quick little laugh himself. At such times his eyes turned up slightly at the outer corners. It was as definite as the curve of a mouth in a smile. His second son, Paris, had eyes that did the same. Paris was killed by the accidental discharge of his own gun one Sunday morning within sight of the kitchen on the Rattlesnake Creek farm on which Dick and I were then living. He was only 26 and Clara never fully recovered from the grief of it. When Paris didn't come back as soon as he should have, we had all gone out and walked and called to him. It was Dick's unhappy lot to find him lying face down and dead on the grass beside the fence which he had started to cross, having first carefully laid down his loaded gun. It was Walter, however, who, when he heard the news, threw himself on the ground and drew himself into a little curve of suffering, like a small wounded wild creature, and lamented, Oh, what shall I tell his mother? Years later, at Thanksgiving dinner at Dick's house, he said quietly, In eighty years you get accustomed to grief. During Christmas week one year, we went to the house on Washington Street and brought Walter and Clara to have dinner with us at the farm. It was a beautiful, still December morning. The farm fields here were snow-swept and serene. Along, <clears throat> along the road, that road runs past the back side of the farm and is the shortcut between our community and Spencer. We saw a deer in our clover field. The children eagerly insisted on being let out in the hope of getting close to it while the four parents watched. The deer bounded away, a lovely, graceful, fleet creature, leaping easily and was soon out of sight beyond the snowy slope. Perhaps it was the sight of this grace and the white morning that inspired Walter's memory. At the dinner table he told us the story of Miss, old Mr. Clay and the white heifer. All this happened a long time ago, fifty years or more. I reckon, he said, I was a young man then and had sold a lot of fine cattle on the Indianapolis market. I was feeling pretty good, of course, young, you know, and sitting around talking with John Clay, the head of the commission house. Mr. Clay had come to America from Scotland, where his father had lived all his life on a cattle farm. In Scotland, Mr. Clay told Walter, the stock farms were large and might change hands two or three times a year, but the tenants did not change when the landowners did. They went right ahead looking, <coughs> looking after the cattle <coughs> and land in the same way under the new ownership. When a tenant got too old and frail to work any more, he did not leave the farm. The landowner was expected to supply him with a little cottage a small vegetable garden, and other such small comforts necessary to him for the rest of his life. John Clay's father had reached that age. As with all dedicated farmers, his love of livestock farming was undiminished. In particular, there was one young white heifer for which <clears throat> the old cattleman had great hopes. He knew his farming days were almost harvested, but told everyone he wanted to live until the white heifer found her calf. Every morning, though, through that cold Scottish winter, the old man took his cane and went out to see the white heifer. She was gentle and promising. Every day he thought she looked more strong and beautiful. Her white coat skin was pli pliable the hair thick and slightly curling at the face and over the shoulders. The old man's visit <clears throat> to her was his sustaining daily adventure. One morning, to his great joy, he discovered the heifer had safely caught calved in the night. It was a good calf. The white heifer made a good mother. Old Mr. Clay returned to the house, satisfied, and the next morning he quietly died.
It was <clears throat> one of Walter's favorite stories. His voice was velvety by the time he got to the last words. In his farm operations, Walter had to be the leader. He could not tolerate any interference with his plans, nor delegate any of the farm authority to his partner, even one who had money invested in the business. But in other interests, he was a follower, more of a hero worshipper than an actual doer himself. He admired men of military career, yet he never served in the army. He admired financiers and statesmen, yet never was willing to hold public office and only reluctantly a place of authority on a church or school board. In his last few years, he developed a great admiration for Alexander Hamilton, to whom he said the country owes a great deal for Hamilton's development of the United States Treasury system and the dollar and Hamilton's help on the Constitution. In 1960, <clears throat> we gave Walter a newly published biography of Alexander Hamilton, and after he read it, he wrote me, I regret that I could not have read the story of Alexander Hamilton in my youth and had all the years of an octogenarian to think it over. Hamilton's government was and still is a republic. It took me 90 years to learn the difference between a republic and a democracy. In a democracy, the minority have no rights. In a republic, the minority have about as much or as many rights as the majority. It was rank heresy for Wilson to claim that the American government was a democracy. All my life until Wilson's day, I never heard of, a US, of the U.S. being a democracy. Our form of government since its foundation has been a republic and is yet. Notwithstanding Wilson's ignorance of our Constitution, also notwithstanding Walter's wife's being a Democrat and a great admirer of Woodrow Wilson, whose framed photograph she set in one of the glass-doored cabinets in which she kept her most treasured old glass goblets and compotes. One of Walter's real-life heroes was his uncle, Stanley Meade, a Civil War veteran who lived on Hillside Avenue and made his attractive backyard a refuge for birds. Stanley Meade's wife, Amy, and Walter's mother, Sarah, were sisters. Stanley Meade had run away and joined the Union Army when he was 14 years old, misrepresenting his age. He didn't really look more than 14 in the photograph, where he stood holding his musket, which was several inches taller than he was. He was a color bearer and served in some of the bloodiest and most important battles, was captured and spent some time in Andersonville prison. His Civil War experiences were the high point of his whole life. He was a gentle, lovable, and stately-looking old man. In civilian life, every year after the war, he put on his Union Army uniform for all the patriotic and Memorial Day parades. Walter spent many happy hours listening to Stanley's war stories and could tell them himself in detail afterward. Stanley Meade was president of the Riverside Cemetery Association and managed it well. At his death, Walter was appointed to this responsibility, and with his usual thoroughness, he informed himself completely of all the financial and legal aspects of the care of cemeteries. Once he wrote me, an important matter on which I wish to write you is the care and maintenance of the cemeteries of Indiana. Perhaps you are not aware that the statute governing the care of cemeteries reads that it is the duty of the county to appropriate a sum relative to the size of the county to care for and maintain every cemetery in it. Is your local cemetery receiving any money from the county commissioners? Every year, the Owen County Board of Commissioners publishes the amounts the various cemeteries receive in Owen County. He greatly admired the somewhat unusual system the Riverside Association had by which a permanent income had been built up, preserving the capital and using only the interest on its invested money for its maintenance.
The Roll of Honor is a plaque in the Riverside Cemetery commemorating the Owen County men serving in various national wars. One of the names is that of Peter Whittam, a Revolutionary War soldier who was one of Walter's heroes. He was, in fact, one of Spencer's heroes. In 1960, for some reason, the town suddenly became Peter Witham conscious and held a parade and program in his honor. There was a speaker band concert, flights of planes and flying boxcars, and marching units uh, of army bands, color guards, and legion veterans. Peter Witham would have been proud if he had been there, and someone could have convinced him all this was in his honor. Now, there were two Peter Withams, explained Walter afterward. The father was old revolutionary Peter. We called him that because he, wa he had been with General George Washington at Valley Forge and fought in other revolutionary war battles. He died in 1845 on his farm three miles west of Spencer. He was 92 and had asked to be buried wrapped in a winding sheet. The snow was deep on the ground. John Hyden, Homer's father, and probably that's why Homer always liked to put his spirit of 76 fife and drum corps into a parade, brought Peter's body to town on an ox sled for burial in the old part of Riverside. They gave him a military funeral with fife and drums and the firing of a final gun salute. A good many years later, they wanted to put a marker on his grave, and they got to digging around the records to find out just where the grave was. In all that time, there hadn't been any marker for old Revolutionary Peter. They could find only two people who had been at the military funeral, and they weren't much help. They'd only been 15-year-old boys then, but were grown men now and couldn't agree when they went to the cemetery to point out the exact spot Peter was buried in. One said it was in the northeast corner, and the other said it was in the southeast corner. They couldn't agree, so old Peter didn't get any marker. But there's a gold star after his name on the roll of honor because I had one put there. When they were making up the list, I just knew nobody was going to buy a star for old Peter Whittam, so I did. Peter's son was named Peter Whittam, too. I never knew old revolutionary Peter, of course, and when I knew his son, Uncle Peter as we called him, he was an old man. His farm joined ours, and every year I went up and made a call on Peter, on Uncle Peter and Aunt Mary. They lived in a one-room log cabin that had a big fireplace and no windows at all. One hot July day, I went to pay my annual call, and Aunt Mary was cooking beans in a big iron kettle in the fireplace. A log, a log was stuck into the fireplace, at, and the end was burning, but the other end was extended way out into the room. I said, Aunt Mary, would you rather cook on the fireplace or the, on the range? She said, on the range, but Peter's too old to cut wood. So I cook on the fireplace. Living in the one-room cabin, they had raised ten boys, and all of them that were old enough had served in the Union Army. There wasn't any stairway in the cabin, but in one corner some cleats had been nailed across a pole, and that was the way you went up into the attic. Uncle Peter had gone up there to take his nap. Aunt Mary said because the flies weren't so bad up there. He came down, and we took a couple of chairs outside and leaned back against the cabin to talk. Uncle Peter had a little scraggly farm, a garden, a cow, and some chickens that were walking around in the yard that afternoon. I said, Uncle Peter, what do you feed your chickens? He said nothing. In summer, they catch bugs and eat grass and lay a few eggs. What they ate in winter, I guess, was their own lookout. I asked him how long he had lived in the cabin, and he said, Me and the old woman came here in 1836, as soon as we was married, and we've lived here ever since. There was a hole in the front door, and I asked him about it. He said, 
Well, one of the boys was home on a furlough in 1865, and he was cleaning his gun, and it went off and made that hole. This visit was in 1896. Brian was running for president of on the free silver issue, and Uncle Peter was impressed with him. Up to that time, he had been a rank Republican, but he was mightily impressed with Brian's free silver speech. You know it ended, you shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. Uncle Peter knew the presidential issue of the day and discussed them with intelligence and a lot of spirit, and he was patriotic. All those sons in the Civil War you know, he was very proud of his father's revolutionary record. He had one son who was blind, and he said he was going to leave the farm to him because he figured he'd need it worse than the other boys. They could get along. With all those sons in the Union Army, naturally Uncle Peter had strong feelings during the war. There was a schoolhouse not far from his cabin in those days, and it was generally suspected that several men in the neighborhood were secretly allied with the Knights of the Golden Circle. They held meetings in the schoolhouse, and nobody knew what was really going on. But Peter suspected, and it made him mad as a hornet. He made plans to catch them. The schoolhouse was set on a hill so that the front of it was right on the ground, but the back of it was high enough above the ground level for a man to crawl under it. Peter crawled under it one night and listened and found out his suspicions were right. So he talked <clears throat> John Hyden into going with him, and they went back the next night. The men meeting in the schoolhouse had posted a guard in front, and when he saw John and Peter, he ran inside and locked the door. Peter was so mad he shot through the door. The shot splintered the door, and the night swarmed out through the windows. John said, Peter, you might have killed... somebody shooting in there that way, Peter said. I wouldn't have cared if I had. By 1903, when Walter married, he was already well launched on an expanding farming career, managing three of his father's farms. Howard was managing the Rattlesnake Creek Farm. Their oldest brother, Jesse, worked in the bank. Walter and Howard produced and sold livestock, especially hogs. They sold and delivered a hundred tons of hay a year, to livery stable, stables and to people in town who had delivery horses or driving horses or a milk cow in town but no hay fields. It was long before mechanical hay balers were available. Of course, the loose hay was forked out of the field onto the horse-drawn wagon and loaded from the wagon on into the town haylofts. The wagon was often higher than the barn loft and therefore required difficult down lifting. Howard said that in those days, Walter's idea of a light Saturday afternoon at the Pottersville farm seven miles out of Spencer was to start to town at noon with seven wagon loads of hay to be delivered and unloaded with pitchforks. The wagons were all loaded from the hay fields on a Saturday morning. The hired men drove the wagons in, unloaded, bought the groceries, and drove back home, a 14-mile trip in all from Saturday noon on. In appearance, Howard greatly resembled his grandfather, Levi Beam. He was short, stout, heavy-featured, and held in his later years, and bald in his later years. He liked to dress up and seemed leisurely after a day's work on the farm. He spoke formally, but said he always felt the lack of a college education. In all the final farm decisions, he acceded to Walter's authority. When Walter's sons were old enough to work on the farm, Howard expected a good deal of them, but taught them more about farming than Walter took time to teach them. Walter, restless, energetically intent on his own plans, was impatient. If there happened to be a patch of bull nettles in the way <clears throat> in the way of a barefooted boy who was sent to head off a runaway cow it made no difference walter expected the boy to wade right into the nettles in summer when the boys went with the men to the farm every day clara packed 
their lunches and Walter's together. At noon, Walter always opened the dinner basket. If there was pie, it was on top, of course, and he picked up every piece and bit the tip off of it <clears throat> before he set it aside to be eaten at the end of the meal. That habit annoyed his sons almost unbearably, but they never had the courage to demand that he stop it. He was tyrannical in those hard-working, tense years. The boys could have appealed to their mother, who was loving and indulgent. They could have asked her to pack their lunches separately, but they all knew she disliked packing any lunch at all, and often packed a light one, but always gave them a good supper at night. In those mornings, when she got the family breakfast, she baked biscuits every morning. She kept the flour in a drawer of the kitchen cabinet. When she baked biscuits, she first put some lard directly into the flour, having salt and baking powder in it. In the drawer, work it, worked it with her fingers, then poured in milk and kept on mixing, and finally lifted out a ball of wonderful light biscuit dough that baked into delicious flaky browned biscuits. And often she sent biscuits and sugar sandwiches to the farm. When her son Richard was married, he told his wife, don't learn to bake biscuits. I was brought up on biscuits, good biscuits too. Howard's mother and later his wife packed his lunch separately. In the afternoon, Dick said we raided Howard's dinner bucket. He knew it and didn't care. I think Grandma used to put it in some extra for us, maybe. At home, Walter was often worried and irritable. When the boys came to kiss him good night, interrupting his reading, he rattled his newspaper impatiently. If one of them ate an apple in the living room after supper, the noise annoyed him. He never gave any of his sons a calf, pig, or colt, because he always felt that half of all the stock and feed belonged to his brother Howard. For by the time the boys were old enough to go to the farm, the bank had been forced into receivership, and Walter and Howard were joint owners of the Rattlesnake Creek Farm. The other farms and all the livestock had been sold to pay the bank's depositors. Walter's oldest son, Richard, was four years old when the bank failed. We had a wall telephone in the kitchen. He said years later, the day the bank closed, Walter came home and sat down on a chair under the telephone and cried. All the stock was loaded in Spencer and shipped to Worthington to be sold because Walter thought it would sell better there than locally. He went along to the sale, and the administrator paid him $25 to get into the sale ring and describe the stock as it was brought in for sale. Some years later, the older brother Jesse moved his family to Indianapolis and lived there the rest of his life. Walter and Howard remained in Spencer and went into partnership on the Rattlesnake Creek Farm. It was natural that Walter would be edgy. He was faced with the financial problems of that agricultural day, which could have made a farmer edgy. Besides, he had to adjust to one farm after having managed three. There was always the danger of flood in spring and market loss at any time. He had a house to buy and keep up in town, a family of four boys to bring up, though they should have been considered an asset to the farm operation, and he had a partner's ideas to subdue. The farm was a hard mistress, and Walter gave it, for the rest of his life, his devoted attention. He was inherently an optimist, never carried a grudge, and in the hard, nervous, harassing farming years, I suspect probably the greatest source of comfort to him was the work itself by which he put his farming beliefs into execution against all opposition. A few weeks before his death in 1962, he said, unasked, well, I guess if I had my life to live over, I'd still be a farmer. Farming, always a hazardous occupation, was just as full of danger in the horse and buggy days as in the mechanized era. When his eldest son, Dick, was about 11 years old and helping on the farm one summer, Walter injured his left hand badly. With the help of one hired man, Raleigh Ole, Dick and Walter were stacking hay in the upper barn, using the track and hay fork. 
which is a savage looking prong even when it is hanging still. Walter was in the loft receiving and placing the huge forkfuls of hay as the rope pulled them in along the track at the comb of the barn. It was a hot day and as always hotter in the hayloft. Walter lost his balance and started to fall out of the loft. Instinctively he caught at the moving hay rope which dragged his hand to the pulley at the loft door, tearing the flesh off two fingers. He had to come down a rickety ladder, and by the time he reached the ground floor, he was bloody and yelling for Raleigh. Dick, terrified, kept asking Raleigh, Will he die? Will he die? Raleigh, about as high-strung as Walter, finally shouted, Well, no, he won't die. All this time, they were getting Ginger, the patient old driving mare, out from the stall and hitching her to the buggy. Raleigh took Walter into town to Dr. Sloan, but the 11-year-old boy stayed on the farm working and worrying and wondering all afternoon how the fatherless family would get along. We lived in the goat house then, Dick had said, and when I got home that evening, Walter was sitting on the porch reading a newspaper, and his hand was in a sling against his chest. From that time on, even after his hand healed, when he walked along the street, Walter held his left hand close to his chest, with the elbow bent as if protecting his hand, and his head slightly bowed as if talking to himself. And, in fact, he often was. His first son was born in 1904, and by the time the baby was old enough to sit up, Walter, with a kind of teasing practical ingenuity, brought in an enormously oversized horse, collar from the farm, so Clara could set the baby in it, a kind of forerunner to the modern playpen. It probably fanned the child's inherited farming yearnings, so that in time he took over Howard's half of the farm. As soon as they could, the boys all began going out to the farm. They all loved it, growing up in the family illusion that Rattlesnake Creek Farm was superior land and, if not conquerable, was at least tameable. On hot summer days when the boys were working at the farm, Walter allowed them an hour to go swimming in the pool in Rattlesnake Creek below the hired man's little house. We never had a watch, Dick said later, and we worried so much about being late getting back to the field that we never really got the enjoyment out of swimming. By the time he had become Grandpa Plus, or actually before, Walter had mellowed. Most people are more indulgent toward their grandchildren than toward their children. It is not a matter of loving the grandchildren more, nor of having less a feeling of responsibility for them. It is, in a way, a tentative chance to recapture something, and then there is a natural affinity between a first and a third generation. Walter tolerated things from his three grandchildren that he would not have tolerated at all from his sons. Once, when we had been visiting there in the afternoon, he decided for some reason not to come to the door to tell us goodbye. His grandson Joe thought he ought to come and finally said, if you don't, Grandpa, I'll pick you up and carry you, and I can do it. Walter laughed, replied, I know you can, Joe, and came, and he endured the children's jokes with real pleasure. One Sunday afternoon, having just acquired a dissented skunk for a pet, we took her over to Spencer to show her to Walter and Clara, who had not yet heard about her. Joe opened the front door quietly and let Petunia go in by herself, she ambled swiftly close to the floor in natural skunkly gait toward Walter on the sofa in the front parlor, and he jumped up with a roar. When Clara mildly called in, what's the matter, he yelled, there's a skunk in here, but he quickly forgave us all for our hilarious laughter at his expense when we came in, and Joe explained. He was particularly fond of his only granddaughter, Dick's daughter, Carol. In his later years, he made a point of giving her the pearl-handled 
knives and sterling silver forks that had been a wedding gift to him and Clara. He wrote, I only regret I've delayed the gift until there is so little left to give you. He often mentioned her especially in his letters, but once when she was four years old and suddenly threw herself impetuously into his arms, he was genuinely embarrassed, laughed, and didn't know what to do with her. I would never have let him get away with that biting off the pie points, Joe told his father. But Dick only said gently, he was different then, there was a great difference. difference too between Dick's viewpoint as a father and Walter's viewpoint as a father. When he was 92 years old, Walter led Dick's white shorthorn bull, Jupiter, in a parade at the Owen County Fair, and we were all watching, proud and somewhat apprehensive. It was a long parade down a hot street, but Walter stepped along briskly, with long steps confident, happy in the showmanship of fine cattle. The big bull followed along, tireless and biddable. When the parade was over and I ran out to congratulate Walter, I took his hand to lead him to the shade. He laughed and said, You make me feel so decrepit, and then gaily told me about Annie, the hired man's wife, and the time Walter had a good bull which he exhibited at a series of fairs. It was about fifty years earlier, he said, but fairs were a good deal the same as they are now. Judges, too, he added, chuckling. He had several good shorthorn cattle that year, and a Scotch herdsman named Andy. Together they had made a tour of county fairs, scooping up a good share of the prize money and ribbons. At one fair, Andy came to Walter after making a tour of the competitive entries and said, We're going to get bet beat today. There's a man here with a lots better bull than we've got. He went away to find the hired man and get the bull groomed for the show ring. Presently he came back smiling. I figured out how we can win today, he said. We'll let Annie lead the bull in. She's pretty. The judges won't see anything but Annie and we'll win. It happened just as he said, laughed Walter. The judges just walked right over and handed the ribbon to Annie, and the man with the other bull was mad as a hornet. He had a much better bull, and he knew it. After the parade was over and the white bull was back in the tent, Dick and Walter, Walter sat down on a cot there where Joe slept at night in order to be where he could take care of his fair entries. Dick told Walter he had an offer for one of his best steer calves, and was undecided what to do about it. Walter exclaimed at once, Sell it, sell it. You can go to Franklin and buy another one. Dick said, But this is an extra good calf, and both of our children want a good steer to show at the 4-H fairs too. Walter exclaimed impatiently, Sell it, sell it. Why, you could get 250 for it. You can't afford to take that kind of money out of the business. It was a basic philosophy he had about farming. Farming came first and everything else after that. It was indicative of the difference between his farming philosophy and Dick's. In Dick's system, a boy's love of farming was an important, long-growing crop to be tenderly nourished and cultivated. In Walter's system, he would have spared no expense or effort to finish a steer to perfection, would have given a pig whatever feed supplement or shelter it needed toward yielding a profit. It explains, said Dick at breakfast the next morning, why he always sold the best calves and the colts we liked best and all those things. It explains also why nobody should ever have expected him really to delegate any of the authority on the farm to someone else. As for example, in the two years when Dick and I lived at the Rattlesnake Creek Farm, and owned half of it, and Dick worked in town. Walter was still the manager. To me, daughter of an orchardist, a farm meant vines, <clears throat> brambles, fruit trees. I planted strawberries on a sandy vine-taken hillside. 
that had not been cultivated for 50 years and had become a squatter's paradise for cutworms. The strawberries took hold and yielded abundantly, but raspberries planted in the same hillside winter killed both years. I had planted grapevines in an unused small hog lot adjacent to the strawberry patch and cleaned out the long banded hog house for a garden house. The grapes had been in a year and were growing well, and a row of zinnias next to them were prospering giantly when Walter suddenly decided to replevin the hog house and lot. Without consulting anyone, he sent Dick's hired man to dig up the grapevines and transplant them elsewhere, but in order to make the morning pleasant for me, he came to the kitchen and did make it pleasant by a long, absorbing discussion of Abraham Lincoln while the hired man dug secretly, screened by the giant zinnias.